Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I welcome you and just bless you in the name of the Lord that you would hear his voice today. And your heart, your heart will just expand and reach up to him because he's reaching to you. I got news just just a few minutes ago that my aunt Ezra went home to be with the Lord this morning. So I want to give my condolences to her children, my precious cousins, Kwesi, Avril, Marty, Andre, and Sue Ann, and Aunt Ezra's siblings, my mom, Uncle Godfrey, Aunt Ezlin, Joy, and Keith. You know, we say she's in a better place, and it's so cliche, but it's true. It's true. She's dancing on streets of gold with her beloved Lord, and she is visiting with so many of our family who've gone before her, like her mother, my grandmother, Eunice. So my heart reaches out to all of you, and I'll see you soon. This ministry is a word ministry and it's tasked with four clear teaching mandates to teach the people about tithe, to get out of debt and stay out, that there are more than conquerors through Christ, and to teach them the importance of the word, knowing it, living it. Today, I want to talk about an important topic. Not that it always isn't important. Everything in the world Every human being in the world belongs to Jehovah God, Almighty God. He created them. Psalm 24, 1 tells us, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. And in his love and his honor for his creation, he placed a priceless value on each of our lives, a priceless value of his own life. And on the other hand, we have a jealous, hateful, created being who was kicked out of heaven with not a sliver of hope, not a chance for redemption and in his rage and jealousy knowing that God loves us for things that he did and he was kicked out with no chance we who God loves have a chance every human being in the world before they close their eyes in death has a chance for redemption, has a chance to be reunited back to God, an important status that Adam lost us. But he knows that he'll never be able to be reconciled back to God, this Lucifer, Satan. So in his rage, knowing his time is very short, before he is cast into a lake of fire, he is doing everything and will continue to do whatever it takes to make sure that many of us who God loves not make it to be victorious 
with God and to make sure that we're on victorious in the earth. But beloved, nothing that he does will succeed unless we give him something to latch on to, to make his case for our destruction. And what methods does he use? The enemy uses fear, intimidation, deceit, lies. And what is his goal? To kill, to steal, to destroy. But God's goal is not only eternity with him, but right here on this earth, in this now time, to live a life that is more abundant. Like a loving father, which is a very rare, almost extinct species today. Like a loving father, God will do everything that he can to woo us. To, to draw us to him. But... Because we are made in his image, he cannot force our will. Being made in his image means we have choice. So we have to choose God. And that's why it's compared to a bride, the church, and the bridegroom, God. You see, when that bride gets before the one who's officiating the wedding, the bride has to say, I do. The bride of her own choice has to say, I do. I agree to marry this person, this groom. And it's the same with us. I want to ask you this question. If you truly love a person, if you claim to love a person, wouldn't you want what's best for them? And could you then afford to have them ignore the warnings of the approaching destruction? Wouldn't you want them to be safe and secure? God loves us. He loves you. He proved it by his death on the cross. And if he's the God of the universe, do you think it's wise to ignore what he says his final plans are? I want to encourage you who are listening, who haven't turned your lives over to the Lord as yet. You haven't settled the question of where you spend eternity with. I want you to spend a few days out of whatever activities keep you busy not thinking. Just spend a few days without those things around you and in you and listen to the voice that we call our conscience. It will speak truth to you. You see, when God created each of us, he put eternity inside of us. He put inside of us what is right and what is wrong. Each of us, because we're created in God's image, we have eternity in us. We have what's right, what's wrong in us. So if we listen to our conscience instead of listening to the wildness, to the chaos around you, to the group that you're in that's constantly advocating against who you are, if you listen, you'll know the truth. And that truth will set you free. If you really, truly want to know the truth, if you pursue what 
with a true heart to know the truth. God, in his love for humanity, for the entire world, will speak to you. But remember, unless you choose God, unless you choose the plan that God has, the only plan, which is Jesus Christ, unless you choose that Christ paid the price to redeem back, to buy back the life that we lost because of sin that Adam, the first man, brought into the world. Unless you choose Christ, you will spend eternity away from Christ. You will spend eternity away from God. And you need to look up the meaning of eternity. It never ends. And it's in a place that is totally separated from your loved ones. It's totally separated from light. It's totally separated from everything that you hold dear. Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 1 tells us, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, we who accept God's redemption, who understand we're not saved for ourselves alone, seeing we have this ministry, meaning we have to pass the good news on to others. That's our ministry. Therefore, Seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. And why does he use faint not? Because, beloved, in this hour, deception and destruction, chaos, is on the loose. Continuing in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 2, we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. Those words that are used, who does it sound like it's describing? Hidden, dishonesty, craftiness, deceitful. Jesus said in John 8, 44, as he was talking to the people who refused to accept them, people who should have known better, he said to them, you are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and did not live in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he's a liar and the father of it. Hidden, dishonesty, craftiness, deceitful. From the very beginning in Genesis, he was described as subtle. We're the opposite. We, his beloved, are the opposite. 2 Corinthians 5.17 reminds us to when we receive Christ, when we believe God's plan for us through Jesus Christ on the cross, through his blood being cruelly shed for us to pay the price, to buy back our lives, to redeem us back to our holy God, when we receive that, we become immediately New creatures. Second Corinthians 5 says, verse 17, Therefore, if any man is in Christ, 
He's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Immediately, we are hooked up to God through Jesus Christ. Immediately, we become spiritually born again, new creatures, where the old is gone. But now, because we have a body, because we have a memory, because we have a soul, we have to deliberately, the Bible tells us, put off, renounce those hidden secret things, those crafty, deceitful, dishonest things. We have to renounce it and we have to put on the truth. Ephesians 4, 22 tells us, that you put off a deliberate act of our will. We have to choose to live that new life that Christ purchased for us with his own blood. Put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on, put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. We have to deliberately put off all those hidden secret evil things that we lived in, that we dwelt in. And we have to put on that new man that now we learn of through the word of God. It's created in righteousness and true holiness. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 2. But by manifestation of the truth. Put on truth, commending yourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Listen to the language. Verse 3 of 2 Corinthians 4. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to those who are lost. If our gospel is hid, hid it is hid to those who are lost hid it says renounce the hidden things see jesus is the light jesus is light so we who receive him are children of the light we're the light of the world and light you don't hide it the bible tells us but you put it up where it shines and dispels the darkness. That's who we are in this hour. We cannot hide who we are in this hour. Everybody's coming out the closet. So we may as well come out too as Christians. As Christians, we need to come out of the closet. And we need to live as the light we are and as salt of the earth that we are. Verse 3, back to 2 Corinthians 4. If our gospel is hid, it is hid to those who are lost, in whom the God of this world, listen, in whom the God of this world, who's the God of this world? Satan, Jesus said in John 14, 30, as he was talking to his disciples, and John chapter 14 is a very important chapter to memorize. John 14, 30, Jesus said, hereafter, I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world comes, and he has nothing in me. 
the prince of this world. That's the God of this world. Notice Jesus says he is coming, but he'll find nothing in me. When the prince of this world, the God of this world comes, what will he find in you? And he is going to come and sniff around like a, like a stray dog. The biggest orphan seeking to make God's creation just like him. Orphans, fatherless, angry, bitter, dissatisfied, never believing or being able to say, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. Lord Jehovah God, and that my soul knows right well. Psalm 139 verse 14. The enemy is going to come sniffing around. And his intent is to cause you to be like him. Psalm 139 verse 14 goes on to say, How precious also are your thoughts unto me, O God, how great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am with thee. See, he promises never to leave us nor forsake us. These are the promises he made to us who receive Christ. And we have to believe that when the enemy comes sniffing around, and he will, that Christ is right there with us. It's hard to believe it if you're not reading the manual he left you, if you're not fellowshipping with his Holy Spirit he sent you. It's hard to believe the truth and easy to be deceived. By the enemy. We need to believe that God's thoughts to us are more than sand. Go to the beach. It's it's practically summer upon us. Go to the beach and you pick up a handful of sand and you try to count it. It's an impossible situation. But yet, his thoughts for us are more than all that sand. He loves us so much. He loves us. And we have to understand, especially in this hour, or we will join the chaos around us. And we will join the groups agitating around us who are bitter and angry and dissatisfied, hating self, hating even their gender. And why? Let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and let's look at verse 4. In whom the God of this world has blinded their minds, the God of this world, Satan, blind the minds of those who do not believe. And that's when you're praying for your loved ones who do not believe. Stop being frustrated with them and understand that you have to pray that God will lead them to a place where the blinders will be removed. It says, He's blinded the ones who don't believe, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And that's what the enemy wants. That's his goal, to cause the ones who God loves who God died for, left his heavenly throne, subjected himself to a human young girl at a time when she could have been stoned and killed, 
when she could have been made to abort that baby? He subjected himself to come to earth, to be born like one of us, to sacrifice his life for us, to be treated with, with disdain and cruelty as an invaluable person. And he said not a word. He put up with all the cruelty because he loved us. And the enemy doesn't want that light, that good news, that glorious good news of what Christ did. Christ, who is God's image, doesn't want it to shine through your loved ones. It brings me, I'm going to sidestep and ask you to be aware of something and pray about it. There is a bill, I don't know its status, but when I was preparing this message, this bill, SB5599, and you can look it up. I'm pulling it up right now. It's, an, it's a PDF. Senate bill report, SB5599, as of February the 6th. 2023, this bill, it should be on the desk of the house. I don't know, I don't know at this point where it is, but it, it's already passed. It just needs to be signed off. An act relating to supporting youth and young adults seeking protected health care services. Hey, that's good, right? That sounds good, right? A brief description. Supporting youth and young adults seeking protected health care services. And if you go down and read the summary of the bill, it still sounds good, but you have to delve further in it. And as you go further and further down into this bill, It says that any person who takes a runaway minor and provides shelter for that minor does not need the parent or the legal guardian's authorization, does not need to contact the parent or the guardian to contact them for any compelling protected Healthcare services. Now that's beginning to sound a little suspicious. And as you go down, listen to what it says the protected health care services that they've been saying over and over and over that sounded so good. Now they're going to explain it. The protected health care services that you don't contact the parent to talk about or to ask permission is gender, it means, that word is used, means gender affirming treatment and reproductive health care services that are lawful in the state of Washington. Gender affirming treatment means health services or products that support and affirm an individual's gender identity, including social, psychological, behavior, and medical or surgical interventions. And it goes on to explain all that it means for our children. In other words, we can cut your children. This bill contains an appropriation totaling seven seven million seven and a half million dollars oh, Jesus it was requested january twenty sixth twenty twenty three 
And this is the bill that's out right now. This is what they're doing. While we're so caught up in what's happening in our own lives, we can't pay the bills maybe, or we're fighting with our spouse, or um, we've got a health care issue. They're making bills geared towards our children, our future, to change the the way this country is supposed to look, to change what it looks like. The God of this world has blinded the minds so the light of the glorious gospel that you are made in his image, that you're fearfully and wonderfully made, that God did not make a mistake when he made you a man. He didn't make a mistake when he made you a woman. He didn't make a mistake when he made you black. He didn't make a mistake when he made you white. He didn't make a mistake when he made you Hispanic or Chinese. He didn't make a mistake. Second Corinthians, back to Second Corinthians, chapter four, verse five. For we don't preach ourselves. I'm not preaching me. I'm preaching the word of God. We preach Christ Jesus the Lord. And ourselves, servants of Jesus. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. That's the truth. That's what will set a person free to understand they are fearfully and wonderfully made and made with a good purpose, with a call on their life and gifts to serve God, to cause others to come into the glorious light because this world is winding down and will disappear soon. And we have to be ready for the next world. It's going to happen whether we believe it or not. And we need to receive it, understand it. And even before I understood what salvation meant, I received it and I passed it on to my child. We have this treasure 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. We have this treasure in our earthen vessels. We have this treasure, Christ in us, our hope of glory, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Listen, what am I talking about today? I'm talking about the need for us to understand. That this perfect love of God will cast out all the fear that's around us, that's pressuring us. To believe like everybody else believes. And they even intimidate us. If you don't believe like we do, then you're going to lose your job. If you don't believe like we do, you're not going to get to to buy from us or, or serve with us. If you don't believe like we do, it's getting to that place. It's already started. And it's getting to that place and we have to start choosing now. We don't choose when it gets difficult. By the time then, our muscles, our spiritual muscles are too weak to choose what's right. Listen. And listen real good. Second Corinthians, let's move. Let's turn over to Second Corinthians chapter 6. 
2 Corinthians chapter 6. And I'm going to read a couple of verses, verses 14 to 18. It says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? In other words, we're not of this world if we belong to Christ. We're in this world, but we're not of this world. We're now, because we're hooked up to heaven, because we're in the kingdom of heaven, extended to earth, we're just strangers passing through. We don't lock ourselves away from the world. That's a mistake we made back in the 60s when we took ourselves out of the public arena. We don't. We get, we extend the kingdom of God Every arena, every mountain of society, the mountain of family, the mountain of education, the mountain of politics, the mountain of sports, the mountain of entertainment, the mountain, every mountain we get involved in. We don't shut ourselves from it, but we don't take in the things of the world we realize we are not of this world. We minister to the world to extend the kingdom of God to them. That's our ministry. Every human that comes to the Lord has the ministry to reconcile the world to Christ. We become ambassadors of the kingdom of God. We don't admire and covet their gifts we don't admire and covet their prosperity. We don't admire and covet their beauty and their boldness. That reminds me, there's so many stars that were coveting what they have. We see our young people, my daughter and I, we were discussing, well, her and her dad had a long discussion about it. And Joshua and I just butt in a little bit every now and then. But, our children, they want to be rappers. They want to be basketball players. But we can tell they're not called to it. They're not out there exercising that talent, pumping the ball up. They're not putting in the work. They're not spending time in their room Developing the music. No, they're out there fooling around. Don't covet the bling that we see. I want to go to Ezekiel 28, 12. Ezekiel 28, 12. I want to show you something. Don't covet the beauty and the gifts of the world. All the glitters. Is not gold. So we see in Ezekiel 28, they're talking now about Satan, Lucifer. Ezekiel 28. Thus says the Lord God, you seal up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Listen, Satan was full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. You have been in Eden, the garden of God, and every precious stone was your covering, the sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, and the sapphire, and the emerald, and the carbuncle, and the gold. The workmanship of your tablets and of your pipes were prepared in you. In the day that you were created, the day that God created Satan as a created being in heaven, it says he had pipes and tabrets in him. And it reminds me of a beautiful organ in one of those old churches with all the pipes and the tabrets that play all the most beautiful sound. And that's why we believe that Satan 
was one of the what was the worshipper before a sound came down to earth we believe that satan got it when he was in heaven as lucifer as the third of the three archangels we believe he got the sound from god first and then he passed it down to the people on earth He was, uh, verse 14 of Ezekiel 28, you were the anointed cherub. cherub. Yes, he was the third, the three archangels, the anointed cherub that covered it. Listen, Satan was the anointed cherub that covered it. That was his role. And I have set thee so. God did it. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. You walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. This being, this created being, was powerful and mighty. And the job that he had was so important did he look down and saw how man responded to his music? Look at how people are, for instance, responding to Beyonce's music. Look at how the children, even the Christians, respond to her creativity. And they're not seeing and examining that she's not serving God. But not only is she not serving God... She's serving Satan. Look at her music. Look at her images. But we only see the beauty and the creativity. Listen to this. What God says about Lucifer. Verse 15 of Ezekiel 25. You were perfect in your ways. From the day that you were creative. I'm sorry, created. You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created until iniquity was found in you. What was the iniquity that was found in him? By the multitude of your merchandise, they have filled the midst of you with violence, and you have sinned. Therefore, I will cast you as profane out of the mountain of God. I will destroy you, O covering cherub. Again, it's repeated. He's a covering cherub. From the midst of the stones of fire, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You have corrupted your wisdom by reason of your brightness because he was so beautiful. His heart was lifted up. Because he was so wise, he corrupted his wisdom. I want to now go to Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14 verse 9. And I want to quickly come to the end. Isaiah 14, 9, hell from beneath is moved to meet you at your coming. Don't let that be said of you. Don't let it be said that hell, think of hell as a living place that is moving and stirring up and opening and coming to meet you. It stir up the dead for you. Even all the chief ones of the earth, it had raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nation. And listen to what they'll say in the end. Have you become weak like us? Are you become like unto us? Listen to this. What is said of Lucifer, your pump is brought down to the grave and the noise of your vials. The worm is spread under thee and the worms cover thee. How art you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For you have said in your heart, listen to the problem 
that Lucifer had, and it's a spirit that he's passing on to too many. For thou hast said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high. <laughs> I, 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 I. And that's his, that's his MO. That's what he's wanted all along, to be like the Most High. And notice what God said. He kicked him right out. Kicked him right out. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians 6. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 15. What concord had Christ with Belial? What concord? What agreement, what covenant, what participation does Christ have with Lucifer's works? He's kicked out. There is no hope for him. He's a fallen being. He's going to stay fallen. And we have to choose Christ or Belial. Christ or Lucifer? Christ or our flesh? What part has he who believes with an infidel? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. What agreement has this temple, this temple of God with idols? When you listen to songs like people, and the reason why I use Beyonce is that there are a lot of people who make music, and we know they're making music of the devil. But Beyonce started out as a child of God. And so very, very subtly, she's brought along a following. And they focus so much on her creativity and all that she's doing that they don't see the idols that she blatantly proclaim and serve in her songs, in her music, in the, uh, the, the creativity, you can see the idols, the bull, all that. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? You are the temple of the living God. And God has said, I will dwell with them and walk with them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be not, be you separate, says the Lord. Do not touch the unclean thing and I will receive you and I will be a father unto you. And you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Come out from amongst them. Put the idols down. Move to the next verse, which is 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Having therefore these promises, what promises? That he will be our father. We will be his sons and his daughters. He says, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit and perfect holiness in the fear of the Lord. Come out from amongst them. Why? Because he doesn't want you to be like them. 1 Corinthians 15:33 has a verse that says, be not deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. He doesn't want you to be destroyed like them. Think of Lot and think of Noah. How God warned and warned. And Noah and his family, just eight people, got into the ark and everybody else was destroyed. Or how about Lot? 
the angel pulled Lot and his two girls and his wife out of the area and everything went up in smokes. Five cities were burned. And of course, Lot's wife looked back. Stop looking back. Believe me, it's rotten fruit. Jesus, that's why Jesus says, these days shall be like the days of Lot and the days of Noah. We are laborers together with God. We are ambassadors to tell others about him. In the meantime, we are his holy temple. We're his husbandry. As we come down to the end of the message, let's go to 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. 1 John 4, 18. It says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear has torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. And we're walking around with too many fears. Fears that we don't have enough to pay our bills. Fears that we'll be so sick, we'll die of a cancer especially. Cancer is a big C. I don't know why we've made it a big C. It's under the blood. By his stripes, we are healed from cancers and diabetes and all these things that we fear. Perfect love cast out fear because fear has torment he that fears is not made perfect in love and that's where I want to rest upon for a minute he that fears is not made perfect in love that word torment it's only used two times in the original Greek Calasis. It means correction or punishment and pen penalty, even in the thought. And it's used again, it's used here in 1 John 4, 18, where it says, fear has torment. It's also used in Matthew 25, 46, when Jesus is talking about the end times. And he says, these shall go into everlasting punishment. That's torment. That's the second time and only time that word is used. But God did not give us the spirit of fear. Fear is a spirit that comes from the enemy. And it's a very powerful weapon of the enemy. But perfect love is stronger and far more powerful than fear. God didn't give us the spirit of fear, 2 Timothy 1, 7 tells us, but he gave us power and love and a sound mind. In the end, if we look back at Isaiah 14, 16, at the end, everyone will look at the devil and they'll say, that's the thing we fear, that? That's the man that made the earth to tremble? We're fearing something that is an illusion, like children afraid of what's under their bed or in their closet at night. Faith as small as a mustard seed, Jesus says, is all that we need. He said, if you have faith, Matthew 17, 20, as small as a mustard seed, you shall say to the mountain, remove. And nothing shall be impossible to you. Nothing shall be impossible to you. So as I end this message, what is God saying to us today? There is so much going on around us. So much. Be careful that you don't get caught up in the wrong group, doing the wrong thing, wasting your energy, wasting your time on what you are not called for. Everything that looks good 
may be good, but it's not a God thing. Is it a God thing for you? Did God say do that? We've got to get to the place where we understand God is love. 1 John 4, 8 and 16 tells us God is love. And he's always with us. And because he's always with us, love is always with us. As we become perfected in that love, understand it, and we can't if we're not studying what it means with the help of the Holy Spirit, who is God himself in spirit form. That's how much he loves us. He didn't leave us alone. He's with us. He died for us, and then he comes and he's with us, and he gave us a manual that he will interpret for us. Don't allow fear of not having enough, fear of not being good enough, fear of not being pretty enough, fear of not being talented enough. Don't allow these fears, fears of not having enough. You have more than enough. You are more than enough. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. We've got to see the day that I finally received and understood that, my life changed. Oh, I still have to battle things, but I began to understand how this perfect love is with me, in me, and will work through me. But I had to learn what that meant. And that's why he said that this ministry, and you notice I bring you word all the time. This ministry is a word ministry to help you understand the word is God himself. So I want to encourage you and challenge you today. Don't allow fear of anything, not being enough. You are fearfully, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. The spirit of fear is not from the Lord. The fear that you need is fear of God himself. No matter how strong the enemy was, God kicked him out of heaven. And you may say, well, why didn't God just send him to hell? No, we had to have choice. We had to choose God. We had to choose And there will be no choice for us if Satan is not around. If Satan is not around with his wickedness, we won't have anything to choose. Because there will only be God and we'll choose him. And he doesn't want us to choose him without us exercising. Or rather, he doesn't want us to come with him without us choosing him and we cannot choose God if the opposite is not around if Satan is not around but he's not going to be around for much longer and like my aunt went home to be with the Lord today some of us are not going to be here when he comes we'll go to him we still have to stand before him and if we don't go to him with him in us If that same spirit, Romans chapter 8, tells us that raised Christ from the dead does not dwell in us, then we can't be with Christ. We're not going to even be with the devil. Because when he's tied up in a lake of fire, we're all in separate, well, not not we, because I'm not going there. All those who go to hell, they choose hell hell themselves God is telling you today he loves you and if you love that person that you're with that you're not supposed to be with if you say you love them then you need to let them make that choice of choosing God you can't afford for Christ to come or that person die and go to Christ And they don't have him in their heart because they'll go to hell 
separate from everybody for eternity. Choose Christ. Choose perfect love. Let that perfect love prepare you for eternity. Let that perfect love guide you right now as you live this life on earth. Let me pray for you before we end. Father, I decree and declare light of the world upon the hearer right now. May they hear, may they receive, may the eyes of their understanding be enlightened that they will understand the depth and the height and everything about their inheritance in you. May heaven expand, may the kingdom of heaven expand in their hearts, in their lives. And the gates of hell shut. Today, I decree a shutting of the gates of hell. And an opening of the kingdom of heaven to receive your children. You deserve their glory. You give everything for them, God. Satan didn't give a tear. He didn't give a hair of his head. But you give everything for them. You deserve their glory. And may they see it, understand it, and receive it before it's too late. I thank you for God. Our country needs you. And it's only as we, your children, wake up, rise up, shine. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Let's rise up in the name of Jesus and push this darkness back and be ambassadors to tell those about Christ before it's too late. Amen. God bless you. Lydia, I love you. Auntie Eslin, I love you. I'm praying for you. I guess I'll be seeing you pretty soon. Be blessed and be encouraged today. Amen. Bye-bye. Talk with you Thursday. 